Welcome to our Hillary Lectures this year, and as I used to have to explain, no, it has nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. St. Hillary was a scholar, a uh, priest, um, now I can't remember if he was a bishop or not, but he was um, a saint in the early church who um, was uh, active in promoting uh, Orthodox Christianity during the Arian controversy. And so he's been known as a scholar, and for centuries, particularly English schools, have named a term after him. I can't remember which is which, but Cambridge and Oxford have slightly different namings of their terms, and one of them uses Hillary and the other uses Lent, and I said, let's go with Hillary. Lent is, you know, already tough enough. We don't have to remind ourselves every moment. Um, and so the Hillary lectures have been going on almost since the foundation of St. Andrew's Academy. Uh, but about every four or five years, I come back and do this seminar on dating games because we have young people that haven't heard it in our classroom, and we have young people in our community that haven't heard it. Some of you parents I know have already been to this at least once, if not twice, not counting my wife even. Um, and. So I hope that a refresher course is not out of line. Um, I know that I have to review everything and think through everything again. And as the times change and the culture changes, so too does the, the nuance, if you will, of how I have to deliver this stuff. So let me, uh, for an introduction, let me give um, what I am about in a heartbeat. I am about a biblical approach to meeting and courting, getting to know whatever term you want to use, marrying and continuing in a lifelong relationship of man and woman. That's what I'm about. Now let me spend some time telling you what I'm not about, because that often takes longer. I'm not about a method to make a perfect choice, produce the best match, say and do the right things to be the perfect potential spouse or produce a child that is the perfect potential spouse, nor even are we about a method that will be the way to honor and glorify God in the arena of relationships. We will talk about some methods. We will outline today a method, not the only one, but a method based on biblical principles. Please remember that methods and practices vary. God's truth is unchanging. Our obedience to his commandments and his word is what is what may not, indeed cannot vary if we are, on, if we are to honor and glorify him. So, this method over here, this method, I mean, you know, the same is true with like child rearing, right? There's a hundred methods out there. There's only one law of God. There's only one word of God. So whatever method we might want to adopt or use has to be in obedience to God's law. So the same is true of courtship and pursuing marriage. <coughs> the title for this talk has been for some time, I, I called it something different at first, and then I realized, no, dating games works because um, that's exactly what seems to be the reality out there. It's just a big game. Yet, relating to the opposite sex for the purpose of finding a mate should be anything but a game. The decision to marry a particular person ranks up there in the top two or three decisions of one's lifetime. There's got to be a better way than what we currently see in the <clears throat> Excuse me. When I use the term courtship, I don't mean recreational dating. I also don't mean the late fad of about, I don't know, 30 years ago up through maybe, it kind of went up, it was thrown overboard 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the courtship model, and, you know, you had all this rage and 
Joshua Harris' wife his dating goodbye. Some people wanted to kiss Joshua Harris goodbye. And then Joshua Harris left the stage, left his family, left his wife, and left Christianity. And so for a while while I was giving this lecture, people were equating what I was saying with that fad. I said, no, no, no. I'm saying something different. And courtship's been, as a word, has been in use a lot longer than that fad had it in use. So please disassociate from that. Um, courtship is purposeful. And it asks the question, is it in God's will for these two people to marry? So if you're one of those people, you're asking the question, is it in God's will for me to marry this guy or this gal? <coughs> it can be distinguished from what might be called recreational dating by its obvious goal, marriage. Dating, I think for most people, does have marriage floating around in the ether back in the back, way out here. I mean, you know, after all, how are you going to know what kind of guy you're going to marry? You've got to, you know, date a lot. But, let's be honest, it's so usually far in the background that no one is thinking about it, especially in the younger generations in American culture. What's the average uh, marriage uh, uh, time for a male in our culture, age? Ooh, 30. Uh, it's got to be almost 30. The la I can't remember the last time I heard statistics. And for women... It's been climbing too. The last time I remember is 26 or 27, so it's probably even a little bit higher now. When do people start dating generally in our culture? Teens. Early teens sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you, I, I know that it's not terribly serious when the 11 year old says, Well, my girlfriend and I. However, it is not unknown for sexual promiscuity to happen in the 11 and 12s. Um, so that means that, let's, let's just peg it to say 13, 14, that means you've got 10 to 15 years of recreational dating before our culture thinks that you're ready to get married. Um, that's scary. That's not a real positive um, way to go forward. In my definition of courtship, I also tend to attach biblical principles that are not commonly found in the dating culture in America. So I define courtship also as being a covenantal relationship and a chaste relationship and a relationship that involves the families of those two that are courted. These are really application of biblical principles, and we will get to them in due course. The historic definition of courtship is to pay amorous attention to, to woo, with a view to marriage. <coughs> Just simple and straightforward. Marriage is in the foreground in sort of the historical understanding of courtship. So let me give you a few presuppositions for this seminar. I'm not going to try to argue everything. Uh, I'm going to argue um, some things based upon presuppositions. So here they are. I'm assuming a commitment to God and his word. Without a strong commitment to God, we will not choose to do that which is difficult. And the model I'm laying out before all of you is difficult compared to what the model is out there in the world today. Most men and women will meet and marry through some process. That's a given. Will it be based upon worldly ideas or will it be based upon someone, excuse me, upon ideas and principles found in God's word? For today, we are assuming that the idea of following God's words and is, a, is an attractive and integral part of your life. And yes, we all fail daily to follow God's word faithfully, but it's I'm assuming that this idea of following God's word is um, uh, front and center for all of us today. So let me state the problem. Historical context. We have, uh, this is another thing that is, um, drives me a little bit nuts as an educator. There's an assumption 
that where we are today and the way in which generationally things change and there's turnover and rebellion, I hear this all, well, you know, every teenager is going to rebel. Like, no, that's not a given. Many do. And our culture is producing lots of them. And particularly the millennial generation's rebellion is um, against kind of the baby boomer generation. And what they're normally rejecting is the foolishness of the baby boom generation. So in some ways, oh, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea. But nonetheless, and, and then Generation X, we don't know what we're rebelling against. We're just rebelling. Um, <laughs> So let's not assume that the way things have been for the last five generations or three generations is how it's always been. Um, that just if you read history at all, it's obvious that it's not always been this way. In fact, education and the training up of a young person was to hand on the values and ethics and mores of a culture to the next generation. And that was obviously also an almost well, in every culture in the history of the world until maybe the 20th century, that was a religious endeavor. Prior to the 20th century, there was no such thing as a youth culture or a stage of development known as adolescence. It didn't exist. Just do some <coughs> historical research. It's very clear. And so we had a major chain, change in practices of courtship at the turn of the 20th century. Again, prior to the 20th century, there's no such thing as adolescence. There's no such thing as a youth culture. In fact, it can be argued this is a bit of a rabbit trail. But if you read the materials, you can see that one of the things that blossomed early on with this change and that has driven the change ever since is marketing. Mm -hmm. Businesses said, oh, hey, we have a new segment to market to. We have the teenagers. And of course, uh, uh, the latest marketing rage has been, well, what do they call them, the tweens? Is that right? You know, the 11, 12 year olds. So we're breaking it down and trying to find a new segment to market to every time we turn around. So. Um, advertisement and marketing has driven this home deeper and it's telling teenagers this is who you are you've got your own world you've got your you're, you know you're in this unique stage of life and then and then what do we turn around and do we want to extend that until about 45 which is really interesting uh, but this is not a um, just general cultural critique today so let's move forward matches and marriages prior to the 20th century always had the involvement of the family. Especially, of course, the parents and especially the involvement of the father. So my high schoolers just dealt with this a week or so ago uh, in class, but uh, who's read enough Jane Austen novels or seen enough of those <laughs> styles of movies to know what calling means? <laughs> what means? Calling. If you're going to go calling, the young man's going to go calling. He's going to go call upon a young later lady after having been invited to do so. And calling took place where? In the young lady's home with her family. Imagine the gods and courage it took for the young man to act in this context. Compared to today where a young man you ne need never meet the father or any of the family to spend time with the young lady. So you had to be interested enough, gentlemen, in that woman that you've seen, that you've heard in group conversation, that maybe you've met. You have to have enough courage to ask if you might call on her, if she didn't hand you her card, her calling card. And if she said no, you had to walk away with your held, head held high and say, well, apparently that's not the one I'm supposed to get to know. <laughs> and then you had to, when she gives you her card, you have to say, okay, this is where she lives, and you have to be able to find that on a, on a map. A map 
Have you seen one of those that you <laughs> fold out and you look at? Um, and you had to make it to her house. And how would you dress? Formally, almost. Now, in those days, formally was quite formal. But it would definitely not be casual. Um, you would have your jacket on, your tie on, and you would ring the bell. And if it was a very, you know, high rent district, the butler might answer. For most of us, some member of the family would answer. And you would be shown into the drawing room or, you know, a reception area. And the, the lady would just come to meet you there, right? No, her father would come and interview you for probably 30 minutes. <laughs> Who are you? I don't know you. If I don't know you, I need to find, I, I need to establish some relationship. So it would be, well, who is your father? Hmm, I don't know him. Who does he work for? Oh, who do you work for? Oh. Um, and on that basis, a father of a young lady could establish a connection and a string of people that he could go to to inquire about you and your family. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It makes total sense if you're thinking about protecting your daughter. And so it might be right off the bat, he knows the name of your father, and you are exiting the house before the lady even comes down. It might be that he knows the name of the employer of your father, and if there's a good reputation there, then we're off to a start anyways. And then the young lady might come in, and she would, of course, probably have fixed yourself up a little bit to impress a young man, and <clears throat> she and he would sit down on a couch, not too close, and who else would still be there? And maybe brothers, sisters, mother, and it would be a lovely family time. <laughs> and it is gone, right? It's completely gone. With the advent of the 20th century, the societal norms and boundaries which functioned to protect young people from hurt, and especially the young woman, not just changed, but were essentially tossed out and replaced with cultural norms that did not have, in, have built in that protection. So um, I can't remember all the details, but there's a number of stuff I've read and, and, and lectures I've listened to. but. Right in the early 20th century, um, it would occur that um, a young man may still have to knock on the door to pick up the date, and he probably quite often still had to meet with dad, but then he would walk downtown with his date and go to the soda fountain, and we've, well, I mean, remember, this is the, what's the name of the artist in the magazine? Oh, Norman. It's the classic Norman Rockwell picture, right? Little Susie and little Teddy drinking their soda, sodas down at the soda fountain. And we think of that as classic America. The lid was already off and the contents had escaped by that time. There's, um, there's some interesting texts. One of them that I'll reference a quote from today is, um, I can't remember the title, I'll get to it, but it's something like from the front parlor to the back seat. Cultural practices, you know. Um, oh, it's right here. Beth Bailey in her book, From Front to Porch to Back Seat, Courtship in 20th Century America. Wow, that's published in the late 80s, by the way. States, the transition from calling to dating was was as complete as it was fundament fundamental. By the 1950s and 60s, classic America for our culture, right? Social scientists who studied American courtship found it necessary to remind the American public that dating was a recent American innovation and not a traditional nor universal custom. It hasn't always been this way. I, I would say that you know, that comes as news to most Americans. Where we are now 
It may be fair to say that the words of Holy Scripture have application to our culture when they spoke of a crooked and perverse generation. Sin abounds in our culture, and the wisdom of God is flaunted and ignored. Remember Judges 17, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. And young people, burn that one into your memory. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. What was it please? Proverbs 12, 15. Proverbs 21, 2, every, man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. It doesn't take a lot of effort to be a fool, does it? It takes a lot of effort to be wise. Recent influences that have affected where we are today. We don't have time to go into each of these, but worth um, reading on uh, and a lot of, there's a popular magazine called Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity using C.S. Lewis's words, and it's Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Baptists, Presbyterians, it's kind of mere Christianity. And there's lots of cultural uh, material in there that you could even search their archives and find some really good materials on any of these topics. So the first one, um, uh, an influence that is huge in where we are today, effective female contraception. The ideology of feminism and changing educational, occupational status of women um, has impacted where we are today in a huge, huge way. And it, um, I, would, I would argue that primarily um, men were the ones that benefited from it in their eyes. Um, yes, we can talk about women that um, were glad that they didn't get pregnant every three years, um, that they didn't have you know, 12 children to deal with. Um, so yeah, women found it positive as well. Men found it positive, though, because it was responsibility-free sex. If it's sex outside of marriage, then you know, contraception helps. I'm going to turn it down a little. It's warm. Is anyone else too warm? Is it just me? I can just open the door and draft the gym cold area. Um, that was one of the biggest changes. Another change, the destigmatization of bastardy, divorce, infidelity, infidelity, and abortion. I'm not making a judgment call, I'm just saying that's an influence on where we are today. Um, next, regarding sexual matters. There's no sense of awe at what God has created. There's very little sense of shame in it. This is seen very clearly in the commercialization of sex and the sexualization of commerce. If you want to sell a car, you put a beautiful woman in a bikini on the hood of the car. And the image the message to the uh, male who's in the market for buying that car is, if I drive this car, I'll probably end up with women in bikinis on the hood of it. I mean, you know. <laughs> um, it's also the um, erosion of shame and awe regarding sexual matters is also exemplified in ubiquitous and voyeuristic presentation of sexual activity in movies and on television. More influence, bless you. Widespread, morally neutral sex ed in schools. Is there such a thing as morally neutral? No. Um, that, is there such a thing as religiously neutral education? 
No. Public schools have been educating religiously for since the beginning. What they're teaching is that God is not involved in history or math or science or English or, you know, I mean, there's never a neutral status. Six, the explosive increase in number of young people whose parents have been divorced. Next, geographically a mobile society, mobile. So, if you thought the Industrial Revolution was a big change, because, and it was, it was huge, people moving from a folk culture centered place of community, you know, civic virtue in your village, uh, help, you know, the, 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 Chester has some of that because it's a small town. But, how often do you see people move in and move out of this small town? All the time. Wendell Berry has been shouting for decades, hey, you need to plant yourself. You need to dig down roots. You need to establish a local presence in a small community. Um, who's read Wendell Berry's fiction? Uh, not many. I recommend it. Um, it might be easier access to Wendell Berry than his essays. Some people find one you know, easier than the other. The, um, the characters in his books are all the same characters. It's just about a small little town in, I don't remember where, the south somewhere, I think. Um, and the center of one of the, one part of the center of the town is the barber shop. Whether you need a haircut or not, you visit every day. You hang out and you talk. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating culture that is already gone. I mean, people are moving all over the country all the time, um, often because, hey, I've got a better job offer over here. So I'll have a bigger house, more toys, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee contentment, peace, relationship, community. Finally, Influ recent influences, pop culture celebrates youth and independence throughout your entire life. So when you are 75, you're supposed to act like a 20-year-old. Um, and we see this. Any vestiges of the previous soci centuries, societal boundaries, are but dim memories and then usually associated with Victorian prudishness and looked down upon, right? Mm -hmm. And that, oh yeah, yeah, well that's, those were very unenlightened people back then. Um, all right, biblical principles. And we're gonna start with the covenant. So this is a biblical concept. Um, it's a concept that is historically around. Um, there's huge works done on this theologically and academically very scholarly works I'm going to um, be as simple as I can so let's define a covenant um, a biblical idea would be a bond made in blood between two or more parties one of them being God so God is part of Leviticus 17 says, the life is in the blood. Well, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Blood is a witness in Scripture. So the blood on the altar witnesses to God, yes, I know, he knows everything, witnesses to God that a sacrifice has been made on, say, my behalf, if I was the Israeli worshiper. Um... We have many instances of the concept of covenant without God involved in history. Uh, quite often, pagan gods were involved. If you go back to the <laughs> near Middle East and you look at all these suzerainty treaties, suzerain treaties, um, so you can have a uh, bond between two humans or two governments. Um, in other words, blood brothers, right? So before the day, days of AIDS, guys, you would have known that um, Boaz and I, we're going to cut our wrists so a little blood comes out and then we're going to shake, but we're going to shake like this and the blood intermingles. There's 
Now you're blood brothers, right? And so that was the concept of um, covenant applied between friends. Uh, these after AIDS that just stopped being popular. Um, so, but but imagine Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. They were blood brothers. Um, you'll also see, and they shake hands, right? Again, the mingling of kind of our inner self. Um, if you've got, uh, particularly my high school class is dealing with King Arthur right now, and King Arthur, in some of the stories, uh, defeats Hengist and Horsa, and they come to uh, a peace agreement, terms of surrender, right? So there's the obligation, you've lost, now you're going to sue for peace, and here's the terms. You have to obey the terms. Um, you have the same thing between governments, you know, so we can imagine some of these ideas that are out there all the time. Um, bishop Sutton, my bishop, wrote a book 30 years ago probably on covenant, and he used a very helpful acronym that um, has stuck with me ever since. I think it can stick with you. What's the Greek word for God, Abigail? Theos. Theos. Uh, in, in English transliteration, T-H-E-O-S. And theos is his shorthand for what a covenant includes. So number one is transcendence. There's always a transcendent party in a biblical covenant. Even in a near Middle East covenant, uh, you, you often had one of the pagan gods, or in the Near East, who were considered gods? The rulers of countries. Rome picked that up, and that's why Christians were, were asked to burn incense to Caesar, because you're worshiping Caesar, because he's a god. Um, Rome didn't begin with that, but they picked him when he conquered the East, then it said, oh, hmm, I like that idea. I can be a god. Let's do that. Uh, but Pharaoh, remember, was a, a god. And so you have this um, practice in the Near East, and it's quite often um, the, the victorious Middle Eastern uh, army and leader would claim himself as the transcendent party. So you always had transcendence. Then you have hierarchy. Who's in charge and, and, and who answers to that person directly and, and, um, and how, does that, how does the government work say or you know, how do we have to answer? Then you have ethics and these are the ethical obligations that the uh, covenanting parties are involved with. Um, so, um, the hierarchical um, top dog, if you will, let's say King Arthur, um, he has obligations in a covenant. It's not just the obligation of those to him, for he is responsible, say, in a feudal society, the king is responsible for his feudal lords, and they are responsible to their king. Does that make sense? So it's, it's a both-way street, and the ethical, ethical obligations often have to do with both. For sure, the person who is um, surrendering and, and suing for terms of peace has terms and ethical obligations to undertake and to complete and not to mess up on. Um, o is for oath. So this is a sworn allegiance. This is a sworn contract. And today, we do that in a real estate contract with our signature, right? So you're obligating yourself, your finances. Uh, if I'm signing for the school, I obligate the institution of St. Andrew's Academy to something. Um, associated with this swearing and this oath is the idea that if we are faithful to keep the ethical obligations, we're faithful to keep our oath, which says we'll keep those, then there are blessings, particularly in a biblical covenant, there are blessings that will ensue. And if you're not faithful, there are curses that will ensue. So if you've gotten on your knees, Boaz, and you've sworn fealty to your vassal overlord, let's say it was King Arthur because you're a very important knight, you're Sir Gowan, you're at least half as big as him. 
tenth as big as he is. Um, and you get on your knees. What does King Arthur do? Right? The sword, right? From one shoulder to the next. Look, guys, the implication of, of that is if you do not keep your ethical obligations that you've just sworn to, that sword will touch both shoulders without going over your head. Right? You're going to lose your head. Um, and then as his succession. So what's the end of the covenant? Is there a succession? So for a feudal overlord in medieval England, say, um, when the king dies, the king is dead, long live the king. I remember as a little child, like, okay, I'm confused. But the king was dead, now we're long live. Oh, the king's son is now the, the king. So it's an immediate assumption of the phrase is, the king has died, long live the king, the new heir. Um, now, he wasn't crowned yet, but there was an assumption right there, right? And so every feudal uh, vassal was expected to come to the court for the crowning, and then after the crowning, to swear fealty to the new king, just like he had to his father. Tons of ways to talk about all of this. So that's Theos. So let's look at... Um, uh, the covenant between God and man. Genesis 17, 7. God's speaking to Abraham and he says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So the succession there is continual. It's eternal for an everlasting covenant. Now does this apply to us? We're not Jews. We're not, well, some of us might be, but generally there's a Gentile group here. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7, 9, and 29. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that continuity that God promised to Abraham is applied by St. Paul in Galatians to Christians, to New Testament Christians. We are covenantally responsible to God, and he has placed himself under obligation to be covenantally responsible for us. Let's take the idea of marriage, the covenant of marriage. Uh, there is a biblical view and picture of marriage. Um, sons leave, daughters are given. We'll pick this theme up again when we deal with the authority of parents. Picture the wedding. Use theos to picture the wedding. God is transcendent and even part of the wedding. A church wedding, right? A Christian wedding in the church. Hierarchy. Groom takes, or um, I don't have time to go in this, into this, but redeems the bride from the father. I think I just spoke with my middle schoolers about husband redeemers um, in the case of, um, what was the story? Oh, uh, Rapunzel, that's right, Rapunzel. Um, it's a, it's, I don't have time, but it's a wonderful theme to do some reading on. Uh, the husband redeemer. So the groom takes or redeems the bride from the father. The father gives the bride away. And we see that right in the action of the wedding. By the way, in traditional wedding um, ceremony, what's the answer to who giveth this woman to be married to this man? There is no vocal answer. That, you know, when, when modernists first read the prayer book and the old language, they go, oh, well, where's the answer? The answer is in the action. The father takes his daughter's hand, gives it to whom? The priest's hand. Who represents whom? God. And the priest puts that hand into the groom's hand. So it's a full action, including all the parties, right? But it's a, it's a physical action. Um, ethical obligations of marriage, sexual fidelity, protection, mutual service, selflessness. And the list is even goes on a little bit beyond that. And those are... Um, what it means to be a wife and what it means to be a husband. And then we have oath, right? Promises are made. Vows are exchanged. 
hands are shaken. Did you know that? Emma, come illustrate with me. It's not as embarrassing for my daughters. I'll get anyone to, to illustrate, but sometimes I'll like, oh. Um, this is what I see a lot in weddings. Oh, let's take the vows together. But if you read the rubrics, the directions of the prayer book, the man shall take her right hand. Now, it's fine to do this, but it's, it's this, right? And then after the vow that he takes, the hands are dropped, and then she shall reach out and take his hand. The directions are right there. So that she is saying, no, I'm going to sit down. You're done. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be at your wedding, too. Um, so there is really that sense, all the sense that we have, a deal on a handshake is there in there. Now, the, the funny thing is that when Henry uh, V's dialogue comes out from Shakespeare's play, he, he says, Kate, I am far too rough, and uh, uh, born as a soldier, I do not know how to woo a woman. Let's just shake hands on it and say, yes, let's get married. And of course, she's horrified. Oh, my Lord, at least try. Um, it's, it's a great scene. If you haven't seen that movie by Kenneth Branagh, that's a fantastic uh, adaptation of Shakespeare's play. And that part is particularly funny. Um, in fact, at one point then he kisses her and she says, no, it is not the custom for women to kiss before they're married. And we'll talk about that lady later. And he says, customs bow to kings, Kate. We are the makers of manners. And so then they exchange just a pretty chaste little kiss in the movie version, and it should be in the play. And just as, you know, this little moment, in comes her dad, the king, and all his counselors. He says, Oh yes, your dad's coming. <laughs> um, succession or continuity. The vows say, "Until what do us part?" Death. death. So death is the natural end of the marriage covenant. Marriage, as we understand it, Jesus says, will not be in heaven. In heaven, what's the marriage in heaven? The church and the groom, Jesus. That's the wedding supper of the Lamb, which, of course, all of us are a part of. Um, so Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, which is the um, passage for weddings, so it's interesting to teach on that. I'll have to leave that for you guys to read. But husband leadership is not to be tyrannic, tyrannical or cruel. Um, you know, I'm sure my wife never says, oh, he's just a despot. Maybe a benevolent dictator. <laughs> it's never to be tyrannical or cruel, but kind and loving. Uh, we are called, husbands are called to love one's wife like Christ loves the church. And Christ did what for the church? He died for the church. He suffered for the church. It seems almost incomprehensible in our current culture. But that's the teaching of Scripture, and we need to get a handle on it as much as we can in order to live it out. Um, the wife is to follow the husband as the church follows Christ. And yes, we have that nasty little word, obey, in the traditional marriage service. And I think if we can um, get our minds out of the nastiness of the 20th century, uh, that I think we can begin to understand uh, what these implications are. Um, periodically, I have to remind my wife that she had to obey me. And she says, well, yeah, but this is stupid. I'm like, well, I don't remember that little fine print unless he's stupid. <laughs> so this is a game we play, um, but it's it's um, if a husband and wife are working together, it's working. There are times when the husband and wife don't work together very well, and they need you know they need to hash it out, they need to figure it out. Uh, but it's not. Um, it's, the, the biblical marriage is not a king and his chambermaid or a king and his 
housemaid or his slave. And this is what we kind of have this picture from the late 20th century that that's what Christian marriage is all about. And there's reasons for that, and most of the reasons are the church and the, the, the example that the church has given over the years. Um, I would like to suggest that the picture that uh, the, 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 the scriptures give us is the picture of the king and his queen. It's because in the wedding, the bride and the groom are crowned, literally, crowns placed on their heads, because we now have a new household. We now have a new covenantal relationship with a king and a queen to have a sphere of authority to rule their subjects called the children, and, and we're going to get to some of that in terms of marriage. Um, so I'm not going to read the long passage that I normally do, but um, let's move to the covenant of the family. <laughs> Remember, says J.C. Ryle in his book, The Duties of Parents, and this is late 19th century. Remember, children are born with a deceitful bias toward evil. Well, he just popped all the balloons of the next 150 years. And therefore, if you let them choose for themselves, they are certain to choose wrong. The mother cannot tell what her tender infant may grow up to be, tall or short weak or strong, wise or foolish. He may or may not be any of these. It is all uncertain, but certain. But one thing the mother can say with certainty, he will have a corrupt and sinful heart. It is natural for us to do wrong. Our hearts are like the earth on which we tread. Let it alone, and it is sure to bear weeds. I think we all know this for our own hearts. If our hearts are gardens, then we are called to tend them, right? And we're in the early season of Lent. This is a particular time to weed the garden. This is a particular time the church is set up to focus on, oh, I've got some bad farming practices. I need to change the way I approach my garden. Uh, parents are responsible, remember, covenantally, for their children, and children are responsible to their parents. Parents have authority. It's not their own authority. It is God's authority. Parents wield the authority that God has given them. Parents are demanded by God to raise their children to godliness. Abdicating that responsibility is not an option. Parents are held responsible. Please don't misunderstand me. Many parents do abdicate. But in God's law, that's not the idea. And, you know, I, I look at my own children, I say, well, okay, they're not horrible, but they're not great. I mean, they're beautiful, <laughs> they're wonderful. No, you just think about all the mistakes you've made. And you realize, oh, man, I'm responsible before God for these. I once had a conversation with a very young Aiden, he was like five or six. And I said, well, God has told me that I need to discipline you. Do you want me to disobey God? just like you disobeyed me just 10 minutes ago. Oh, man, he had to wrestle with that one. It's like, well, does God give chances? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Ephesians 6, 1 and following, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So obedience and honoring of children to parents comes with a promise of good life. Wow. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. I think mothers can do this too. But bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Now, if Emma's wrathful at me, it is possible that I did not provoke her. But it's also possible that I did. So oftentimes I've stopped and think, okay, did I handle that well? Did I deal with that well? You're supposed to say always. Always. Children are to obey and honor their parents, even when it comes to dating practices. Hmm. Teenagers, can that be a challenge? Young adults, can that be a challenge? 
Fathers are to train their children in God's training and in God's fear and admonition because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This training does not end when it comes to children being involved with special friends or the process of seeking a mate. Proverbs 12.15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. It bears repeating, doesn't it? Proverbs 22.15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. It takes years to remove the foolishness of our hearts. And some of us who are quite a bit older than you young adults are still finding foolishness in our hearts. And we're having to purge it, get rid of it. Try to seek to be wise. Children, even adult children, need the wisdom of their parents. The covenant of the family is for the benefit of the family, particularly for the protection of the children. Yes, I know that many of you monks and nuns are um, beyond childhood proper, but I still go to my father for wisdom and my mother. Um, now, some people in this world do not have fathers and mothers that have wisdom to give. And that is a special case. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it's very special. It seems to happen all the time. But that is not the norm. That's not the expected norm, particularly within the church. And we're expected within the church to hopefully have healthier and healthier families. But if we're doing our, job, our mission job right, then we're going to always bring in unhealthy families. So we need the wisdom of the parents or, well, we'll get to other options to replace parents if we don't have parents uh, that can function in their family. Uh, let's take a brief break. We've got more coffee, and I think we have a little snack. So, dismiss for break. Welcome back. I um, will... I do have a lot left, but I think I can move a little quicker through some of this. So if I talk a little fast and you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll stop. Uh, the definition of love is what we're on, if that's in your notes. Um, Henry Smith said, first he must choose his love, and then he, and then he must love his choice. The Puritans were very often I don't quote them very often, but they were very often uh, would say about finding a mate. Um, it's not so much about, I'm going to summarize, it's not so much about uh, falling in love with the right woman. It's about finding the right woman that you can love for the rest of your life. So love is not like... You may or may not like your spouse. I, I have a feeling that most women, after the honeymoon, however long that some people, that only is one day, um, and I don't mean the trip, um, they roll over in bed and they just say to God, oh my Lord, what have I done? Who is this guy? Love is not just affection. It's not just enjoying sensations. A boy might say he loves pizza today. What he's really saying is that he enjoys the sensations that pizza gives him. When a boy says that he loves a girl, there's a likelihood that what he really means is that he just likes the way he feels around her. He likes the sensation he has when near her. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Young love... Um, Oh, aren't they cute? You can just tell, oh, I'm so excited to be with someone. That's not bad. How you move forward from there might be problematic. Love has the best interests of the beloved in mind. It is not self-centered, but others-centered. This, of course, is agape love. And C.S. Lewis's um, Four Loves is actually a very good text to read in light of this conversation. Remember 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does, does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. 
bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. <coughs> Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. This is the ultimate other-centeredness. And our groom, Jesus, has that kind of love. That love is agape love. The other, the other loves that we see in the Greek language are good loves in their proper places. Um, phileos is what? Brotherly love. Brotherly love, the city of Philadelphia where there's no crime ever because it's the city of brotherly love. <laughs> we get a little confused, I'm afraid, but um, it, was a good, it was a good hope. Um, so agape is the self-sacrificial love that is the foundation for marriage. Marriage... Um, in Theology of the Body, John Paul says that, really, if I could summarize, in one sense, marriage is the giving of oneself to the other. And in particularly, he talks about that in sexual union. But it's, it's that in everything. It's, it's the self-giving of oneself. Um, so, let's go back to parental authority. There's a responsibility for one's children when you are a parent. This means, amongst other things, protection. And there is a whole um, lecture's worth of material all over the Bible about this kind of concept. I'm going to be um, perhaps a little bit um, shorthand, but I think you'll get the idea. Uh, Exodus 22, 16 through 17. If a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price for her to be his wife. So if a young man in Israel entices a, a young girl um, who is under her father's care and protection and um, has promiscuous sex with her, then he is called upon by the law to pay the price and to marry her. No, if her father utterly refuses to give her to him because he's an idiot and the father has some brains, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgin. So he'll still pay, but he doesn't get a wife. So who is responsible for the daughter in this situation? The father is. Who is responsible for his actions? The man who seduced her is. He is required to pay the bride price and to marry her if the father so chooses. If he desires it. Sons leave, daughters are given. Genesis 2.24, sons leave. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Psalm 78.63, the fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given in marriage. So the norm is for maidens to be given in marriage by their fathers. <laughs> Judges 12.9, he had 30 sons, and he gave away 30 daughters in marriage, and brought in 30 daughters from elsewhere for his sons, who were given by their fathers. Um, there's this biblical idea that sons leave, and then cleave to their wives, but the wives have to be given by their fathers. So it's not... Um, it's not about ownership. Well, I own my daughter, so I'm going to give them away. That's not how it works. That is what some people sort of presume with the biblical language. But it is about covenantal authority. And we still see that in the wedding. And, you know, many people say, who, who, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Many contemporaries will say, that is just, that's awful. That's patriarchic, you know, blankety blank, blank, blank. Um, but there is covenantal understanding here and there is primarily protection for the young lady and that's what we have none of today none of and I as a priest deal with a number of these young ladies that are broken and beat and bruised not physically but emotionally and spiritually because there is no protection and I'm overwhelmed by the number of dads who do almost nothing to protect their daughters. I don't think most of them do it willingly or even consciously. The, the culture around us just doesn't teach them to do it. 
And worse, the church and its culture doesn't teach men to do it. So we need, there, there's a sense in which, okay, so let, let, me, let me throw this the other way. So we have this um, courtship fad, you know, this Joshua Harris thing, and I mean, all sorts of people, and all, I mean, it was everywhere. I bumped into it all the time. <clears throat> particularly, I have to say, particularly in the, <clears throat> in the um, Reformed churches, you know, that I had contact with. Um, and, um, oh, we had the rings. What was the ring fad? What was that called? Oh. Purity rings, right? Which stats say that, hey, it really helped. It, it, it pushed off the average age of the loss of virginity to someone who wasn't your spouse to, like, a year and a half later than the average. Um, and so, in some sense, there's, there's nothing wrong with that idea and that concept, but when we make everything a fad, it's just, it's, it's kind of becomes a joke. Um, so the courtship thing, I, I've read a lot of people who are just really ticked off because they bought into the game and now they're 35 with no spouse and something went wrong. And I've read some, I've read some um, people that reject all of that and reject Joshua Harris, well he does too. And, um, and they said, you know, we really should be dating. We, and I just thought, wow, we've rejected something that was erroneously headed in this direction. And so we've turned this way, and we've missed the reasons why this fad started. We've missed the, the problems and the difficulties and the temptations and all these other things. And I'm just saying, well, you know, that's, that's not really much better than that. Um, and finding, you know... The pendulum swing is just ubiquitous in these sorts of situations. So, um, so I've known um, people that have taught, people that have practiced, young and old, that, uh, well, a woman's job is to be a wife and a mother. And really, that's your only job, so I'm not sending my girls to college, but I'll help get my boys to college. So with that family, I politely... Um, so, wow. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Um, you tend to be real hands-on and, like, you know, working with your hands, your boys are, and chances are, you know, most of them will get jobs in vocational stuff, and they probably don't need a college degree to do that, but you've decided that your daughters will be the mothers of their children and homeschool their children, so who needs the education now? That, that conversation went elsewhere quickly. Um, there's just that sort of presentation of Christian living is damaging, in my humble opinion, to the gospel. Uh, because it, it doesn't... Um, it automatically um, just places people where they need to be without any... Grounding context, concept of individual people. Um, I do, I do tell my young ladies at school that, hey, keep in mind if you choose a vocation like I don't know, medicine for instance. The next eight to ten, eleven, twelve years of your life are going to be studying, and that doesn't leave a lot of room for courtship. Doesn't leave a lot of room for marriage and family. So at least go in with your eyes open. Um, and I think that, that we have a lot of we have a lot of young ladies, well now older ladies, who feel the clock ticking, and they want a family and they want children, and there's no way to get it now. And there's just a lot of things in our culture. Now also each one of us has to say, well, where has God led me? How am I moving forward? So God may indeed call a young lady to the mission field where she doesn't have a husband. That's particularly hard. Um, may call uh, a young lady to a convent where her husband is the church. It's Christ. And um, so there's, there's room for a lot of breadth. And when I saw that covenantal courtship thing, well... 
you know, my daughters, oh, well, that's so great, you're going to be living at home until you get married. And if you never get married, you're going to be old spinster at home and take care of me in my old age. Now, I've told that to Lizzie because I just want someone to take care of me. It has nothing to do with courtship model. Um, and because I'm getting so old that, you know, by the time she moves out, I'll probably be broken. So you can't move in. Um, but literally, young ladies living at home in their 20s and then into their 30s, and a lot of young ladies will marry anyone to escape that. Depending also on the relationships, you know, within the families. Um, and I've seen this in multiple different contexts and multiple different examples. And I don't think it's healthy. But, does, the, when Emma goes off to wherever, for college next year, does, does my responsibility to be her dad and protector end? No, not at all. So, um, one of the things that I pursue strongly with my seniors is you need to find a church near the college you're interested in. And if there isn't one that you can be invo involved with, then you need to question very much, particularly young ladies. Uh, yes, I knew he was a sexist. Um, I think there are differences. Um, So there are women's age and women's location issues. We need to appreciate the father-daughter relationship we see in scriptures. Even if a young woman is off at college, this does not mean that she is not under her father's authority, protection, care, wisdom. Practically, can she ignore all of that? Of course. And probably, arguably, most young women do exactly that when they go to college. Of course, most of their dads don't really have any of this in mind. Um, the disasters we see in the culture all around us, even in the life of the church, show us that the young lady ignores dad's authority, protection, wisdom, and care at her own peril. And so we see lots of young ladies at college who are disastrous in their lives lived. Hurt, broken, damaged by the sin that they've become entangled with. But doesn't this authority of dad and, you know, um, parental care and responsibility and protection of dad seem a little bit impractical at some point? And yes, it does. So if you've built a good relationship with your daughter, you will be having conversations with your daughter all the time. Um, and so I fully expect to be hearing from my daughter at least once a day. <laughs> Um, once in the morning, once in the evening even, right after morning and evening prayer on her part. Um, but we need, there is a need for a parental type. There is need for um, the church to step up and offer parental care. So as, boarding, as a boarding school, the teachers and the staff are in loco parentis, in place of the parents. We don't replace the parents, but we stand in place wielding their authority. And my students know that if you have disobeyed um, the teacher or the headmaster or done something wrong at school, you have dishonored your parents. Because dishonoring the people they put in charge of you is dishonoring them. And so it is very important to have this in a young woman's life and, and a young man's life as well. So you might have relatives in a given city that a daughter goes to college in. Um, but you should always have a church. And dad, you should know the priest or the pastor of that church. And you should have conversations saying, look, please look out for my daughter. You know, she's, she, she's, you know, like this, this is, she struggles with this, but she's got a good group of girls she's living with. Not, she's got a mixed gender house that she has roommates in. Um, and that, I think, is huge, and I think that the church needs to wake up and step in and do more of that. So, when we have all these college students hanging around Chester, well, we have usually a handful that are that age, um, that's my job, is in some ways to be dad, to be Father Foose. Uh, I'm the spiritual father of a community, but that... that implies automatically other
practical roles that the spiritual father, because dad at home is also the spiritual father of that little household. You know, dads are priests to their household. So um, I think, see, maybe you got there, building trust between father and daughter. So basically you should have a completely legalistic household. Where, no, this is the problem. and This stuff lends itself so easily to legalism. It's about relationship, not about rules. Trust must exist between members of any family, particularly between fathers and daughters, if the daughter is to trust the father to care for her. This trust must be built from the time she is a little girl. Get married, daddy will find you a husband. <laughs> and then I tell her I'm teasing, but together we'll, we'll work this out. And I trust my girls to have at least enough heads on their shoulders to probably find someone that they're interested in that has good qualities and good characters. But they might have a blind spot, and they've never dealt with someone like this, and it may take someone our age about five seconds to see them. <laughs> but it might take someone Emma's age five years, unfortunately maybe disastrous years, to see that. What girl wants to trust her father in matters of dating and courting when she can't trust him to be there, to care, to protect from the time she's yay high to a grasshopper, to be looking out for her best interests at all times? Sexual purity and chastity. C.S. Lewis says in his Four Loves, We use a most unfortunate idiom when we say of a lustful man prowling the streets that he wants a woman. Strictly speaking, a woman is just what he does not want. He wants a pleasure for which a woman happens to be the necessary piece of apparatus. How much he cares about the woman as much as such may be gauged by his attitude to her five minutes after fruition. One does not keep the carton after one has smoked the cigarettes. <laughs> C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Wow. Um, the objectification of women in our culture is, I don't know how it could be more. Um, I showed my students five years ago, maybe four years ago, a video um, that is well worth watching. A young lady, very classy young lady, um, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s, um, did some research, I don't know if, I don't remember, this might have been a master's thesis or, you know, who knows, but some, some academic project. And she um, did, first of all, she, she talked about the history of the bikini, and how scandalous it was when it first came out. Of course, I think the French gave it to us, right? Mm -hmm. That was surprising. Um, and she talks about how things have changed and how people started to accept, and, and it continues to get skimpier and skimpier. Um, and then she talked about the research done. Um, they wired up men's brains to analyze what parts of the brain light up when you do. And so they would uh, wire up men, young men, like college-age men. It was done on campus, I'm pretty sure. And then they would, um, they would uh, see which part of the man's brain lights up when a picture of a woman in a bikini is put in front of them and consistently the same part of the brain lit up for every guy. It's the same part of the brain that lights up when he, when a young man sees a power tool. <laughs> wow. Of course. That object looks like a lot of fun. It counts for both. That's the objectification of women. What does the scripture say? There's a... Did I put that list down there? You, yeah, the whole list. Let's just go through the bolded ones. Uh, first, this, uh, the first set there of, lit, of scriptures deal more with what to avoid. Um, particularly, note the harmful effects of sin. Ephesians five three. But fornication on all fornication on all uncleanness or covetousness, it is not even named among you as is fitting for saints. Hebrews, marriage is honorable among all and bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterators God will judge. Proverbs 6, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. 
excuse me, First Corinthians 6, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. These are powerful stuff. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom uh, you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The second set are references that push us to understand the basis of sexual sin. They go right to the heart of the matter. 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. These are heart issues, not just physical issues. Mark, so he said to them, Are you thus without understanding? Also, do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach, and it is eliminated, <coughs> thus purifying all foods? And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of his heart, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lawlessness, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. It's the heart. The heart, says the Proverbs, is the wellspring of life. All the issues of life come from our heart. You've heard that it was said in Matthew, uh, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lust to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what does this look like? Our society tends to say that sexual purity means everything is fair game except actual sexual intercourse. That has been, um, you know, Bill Clinton helped to popularize the Baptist view. Um, I did not have sex with this woman meant for him that he did not have sexual intercourse. Um, a survey 15 years ago almost, 10 at least, said that um, the stats were that 70% of 13 and 14 year old girls, so it's a statistical analysis, do not believe that oral sex is sex. The biblical model, model uh, is chastity and purity, which is for the protection and care of the individual, the family, the church, and the culture. And it is not just physical, it starts in the heart. So, now, is it better, so the young man is lusting, so he's already committed the sin, he might as well go have promiscuous sex. No. It is better to stop the sin early than to have the sin come to full fruition. It's already come to fruition in your heart is a sin and needs to be repented of. And repentance means walking the other way, right? It means leave that behind and go the other way. So, the person who has um, already given away his virginity, well, it's already gone, so I might as well just have sex with as many people as I can. Again, no. Sex, uh, a friend of mine says this, and I, I borrowed it, sex is soulish. Sex is soulish. The people that I have counseled with, tried to help, worked with, that have had, you know, I had one 17-year-old girl who could not remember how many people she'd had sex with. The brokenness was unbelievable. Unfathomable, fathomable. It was just more than she could handle. All of it, always. Just so it breaks us. This type of activity. Um, so police officers, when they actually have to pull their gun and shoot someone, or kill someone, they go through quite an emotional trauma. And soldiers, very often the same thing. Um, this, this, is, this is big stuff. This is big life stuff. And we've got, you know, kids having sex when they're not even prepared. We have kids shooting one another in gang warfare. They don't understand it. They're, you know, I've worked with those kids in juvenile prison, you know, with murderers and rapists. 
and they, they, they don't understand themselves, they don't understand the victims, they don't understand anything. They're far too young to comprehend any of this. Physical things matter. So, in baptism, do we just pretend to use water to baptize? Yes, I know some churches do, but the great majority do not. When we baptize, we use water. Um, and depending on the, the, the tradition, it's um, water poured, or it's water that you're in, or you're dunked under and held under like my dad did for like minutes. <laughs> uh, actually, almost lost me. We were in a river, and the current almost took me away. Um, in baptism, we actually get wet. In Holy Communion, we don't pretend to eat. We actually eat. We chew. We take into our mouths. These are sacraments. They're signs and seals. They have real application in our lives, and they are really physical. What's the definition of sacrament? An inward and spiritual sign that's in the reality. Good. Inward and an outward and visible sorry, I got it backwards. An outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. That's wrong. He's wrong. Um, physical things matter to God. You were not created as a spiritual being. Christianity is not Gnostic. Physical things matter. The inside of your head is not more holy than your hand. Your heart is not more spiritual than than your body. God cares what we do with our bodies. God meets us in physical ways, meets us as we are created, physical beings and spiritual beings. What's the ultimate sacrament? <coughs> Jesus. The incarnation. Jesus really came, and he really came in the flesh. In his death and in his resurrection, he really saved us. If his death and his resurrection were not physical, was not a physical death and a physical resurrection, then the gospel would be no good news, and Christians would be the world's biggest fools. So what is a model of courtship that is based upon these biblical principles? A model. Take the principles, apply them however you want, but here's, here's one way to look at it. Another quote, courtship, a wisely instituted practice, was meant to substitute for any lack of personal wisdom. I know, this is my favorite thing, I know, I'm a youth pastor, I'm going to be really hip, I'm going to be really cool. Let's bring a hundred young people into a gymnasium and lock them in all night long. It's a lock-in. It's the best idea for youth ministry ever thought of. They're all 13 through 18, but I've got six adults. Oh, that'll help. You should have 200 adults for 100 young people. Courtship is to substitute for any lack of personal wisdom on the part of those courting. Basic principles of courtship. Enter into covenant courtship only when ready to get married. So I say to all of you young people, you're not ready to get married unless you can tell me how you're going to pay for a family, a house, all the utilities, etc., etc. And young men, you're not ready to get married until you have a job that has a future. You don't have to be a brain surgeon. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, although that's always nice. Um, but can you provide for a wife and children? That's a serious question that you have to seriously answer. Um, dads who are smart tell their girls, yeah, hmm. Uh, 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 let's put it this way. I've been saying to my students, um, a boy is not a man because he can impregnate people. Just because you have working apparatus doesn't make you a man. Manhood involves responsibility, discipline, 
a work ethic, um, honesty, integrity, kindness, gentleness. Even if you happen to be a very large man and you're like a bull in a china shop half the time, you have to work at gentleness. <laughs> um, so, when you are married, excuse me, when you are ready, then you can pursue a serious relationship. So what does that mean for young people? Well, I can't go on any dates. Um, why would you go on a date with someone of the opposite sex? How about you go hang out with your friends? Mm -hmm. How about if there's a new friend who's really handsome, Elizabeth, that you invite him to participate in your group of friends, in your friend group? So first of all, emotional chastity is huge. Continual entrance into dating relationships that our culture does when one is not ready to be married is practice for divorce. Leave the relationship when the relationship is not convenient any longer. And that's what so many of our young people do. They just say, oh wow, you're really cool, Boaz. Wow, did you see Boaz? Oh, he's so handsome. And Boaz says, 15, of course I'm handsome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not old like Father Fizz. And and then she gets to know Boaz and realizes that Boaz is more concerned with the buying and selling of you name it and economic <laughs> success than he is in her eyelashes batting back and forth because that got old. <laughs> and so, well, this is really not going to work out, Boaz. I'm sorry, you were so cute. You still are kind of cute, but, um, you know, you're just not giving me the emotional um, oomph that I want. And so it's over. It's over and done with. And we've got relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship. And then finally you come to marriage. And what have you practiced the whole time? When the going gets tough, just get out. Be done. So it's no big surprise that divorce is huge in our culture. B, basic principles of courtship. Parental involvement. Dad protects daughter or daughters. Many men have abdicated this authority. Women will be attracted to men that are assertive, even if the men are ungodly. So the relationship between fathers and daughter is of paramount importance. Dad has abdicated. The daughter is going to look anywhere for the emotional security, the sense of assertiveness and protection. And in my experience of 30 plus years of working with teenagers, they're going to go to any guy that will give them that. If he be 14, 17, 25, 30, it's really ugly. And they will give their bodies away and their hearts away in a moment. And the guy always leaves. Remember the card. C, avoiding physical relationship. Actually, having that as a goal, to not have a physical relationship, would be something novel, right? That would be new and exciting. But having that as a goal actually makes a world of difference. If you uh, are in a courtship relationship and Boaz, you're 23 with a good job, then, right, you're at least in some sense ready. We don't know about your emotional maturity, but um, you're, you're 20, you're 21, you're about ready to graduate college, well, that might be about the right time if the right guy was there. So actually sitting down and saying, hey, I'm really attracted to you. You're just such a beautiful woman or you're such a hot hunk of a man. I don't want to be sleeping with you before we're married. And you have a conversation, you say, yeah, the goal is to avoid physical relationship. That will make a big difference in how you approach things. Because so often, young men and women find themselves just suddenly, oh my gosh, how did that happen? <laughs> I was teaching with someone and got to know him a little bit. And we were talking, he says, yeah, school just started up. Um, and one of my really great students was pregnant, like belly out to here. And I went, what? I just, I was so shocked. I didn't expect this. And I said, oh my gosh, well, what happened? 
And he says, what a stupid question, right? I mean, I know what happened. And she says, oh yeah, it was an accident. And he says, he literally said this, he'd lose his job, maybe he lost his job. He says, what, did you trip and fall on a penis? <laughs> but if you're not careful, you'll find yourself in a place that is not the place you should be. And it's scary how quickly things can go the wrong direction. So aim towards God's best. Sex is a gift from God. He wants each of us to enjoy it in marriage. Outside of marriage, it is not what it's created to be and will break you. It will break your soul. Um, what are the benefits of having this really serious, upfront, hey, I'm not interested in taking your clothes off approach? Benefits are sexual purity, obviously. Here's another benefit. Talking. Real communication, actually getting to know who someone is. I know it's a real shock when people get married and go, wow, who are you? Intellectual and social interaction is forced. You have to do something if you're not going to be uh, messing around, so to speak. Okay, what about avoiding temptation? How do we take care of that? How do we avoid those bad moments? First of all, avoid time alone. There's a reason why calling meant being with the young lady's family. If you're away at college, find ways that you are accountable to not be alone. Find ways, so a group of friends is a great way to do this. Yeah, you can sit over to the couch over to the side and have a private conversation. Um, you don't have to constantly be having the group conversation. It's not like, it's, it's not some weird straight jacket thing. But avoid time alone. Number two, avoid time alone. <laughs> Number three, avoid time alone. Spend time with friends, with church community. Um, this is where the church comes in and says, hey, we're having a get-together, everyone come over. And yeah, Fred and Sally can sit on the swings and have their chat, private chat. They're all, oh, look at the lovebirds, aren't they so cute? Um, and they can have it within the context, not just of friends, but of adults that are married and have experience in lives. And then hopefully the relationship is so good that little Fred and Sally come talk to the adult about, hey, you know what? You know, we'd like some advice. We're really, uh, want to tear each other's clothes off, or, you know, whatever it is. And I once, uh, my priest once got a phone call in the middle of the night, and um, they said, look, can you, can you give us, uh, can you give us marriage, uh, give us a wedding tonight? We need to be married, right now. It's like, it's midnight. <laughs> yeah, but we need to do this right now, trust me. Like, seriously. I'm like, um, he says, you leave and go take a cold shower. I'm going to bed. Good night. I didn't even think you knew who they were. I don't know. Um, so spend time with families. Um, so that means that one of the first things, if, in, in a college world, okay, Emma's off at college, and she meets the guy of her dreams. This is a spitting image of her dad. It's amazing. Uh, <coughs> he's bald already. Um, and she calls me and says, wow, I met this guy, Dad. Okay, well, does he go to your church? Yes, of course, Dad. I'm not stupid. Um, so, and his family's at your church? Uh, no, he moved here from, you know, the East Coast. Okay, so, you know, you're going to spend time getting to know him within the context of church and friend groups. And so at some point, let's say she was actually 22, she's actually ready to get married, he's you know, got, uh, gainfully employed, making more than 10 bucks an hour, and they've been hanging out a long time, they're actually ready to be serious. They haven't done one thing that they need to really do. She needs to travel out to the East Coast and meet his family and stay um, in a friend's house downtown as opposed to his house in suburbs. And, you know, there's all sorts of ways to make all that work. And then he needs to come out and meet me. And that's not going to be pleasant. 
Um, and that is an important part, because if you do not know the family from which your spouse comes, you don't know half of your spouse. You haven't gleaned the information that you need to glean to understand what's, what makes up this person. Um, if, if your family, um, if the family that this young lady comes from is not Christian, and she's a convert, let's say, then you have to really, really think through, what does that mean? What does she understand to be common Christian values? What does she understand, um, even, I mean, hopefully you found out already about, um, um, you know, date, dating and courtship, sexual purity, things like that. What's the place of money in the life? What, did she grow up with a dad with lots of money or no money? Did she grow up with a mom who spent money willy-nilly and got the family into debt? You know, all these questions, even just girls, watch how the love of your life treats his mother, mother and sisters. Now, <laughs> Noah's like, I love my sister. <laughs> watch how your potential spouse, because that's what courtship is, or serious dating, or whatever you want to call it, you've got to realize that you've moved into the place of serious movement towards marriage. And prior to that, don't mess with serious relationships. But when you're ready to have a serious relationship, you're ready to get married, then look closely because you're going to learn a lot about your potential spouse by watching them interact with their family. And a lot of people are really good at hiding stuff. And if you have never had a spat with your potential spouse at all, I'm really concerned. Two people with brains are going to disagree periodically. So, guys, particularly, commit to honoring, respecting, and protecting the young lady so that you never put her in a compromising situation. In, um, you know, 150 years ago, if a young lady was to be alone with a man, the assumption is that her chastity is gone. So you never would place a young lady in such a position. Maybe we don't have the same culture. But people are going to think it, whether, you, whether they admit it to you or not, they're going to think it. So we really do have people that are thinking the same thoughts, so don't ever do it. Don't put your lady's um, reputation at risk. Reputation matters. Uh, what are the implications of physical actions? What is the implication of this? Yes. No. Yeah. What? I'm sorry. I, I, that you're dating. Dating? Not necessarily. I don't think. <laughs> Just could be friends. It's polite. It's genteel, if you will. Um, but once we go to here, they and I did it in public on my own. <laughs> There's implication here, and it's more than this, isn't it? And what about this? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Interdigitation, right there. So the implication of an older man with a woman her age holding hands is a father and daughter. If it's not, most of us are shocked, right? And I know someone who married someone 50 years his junior. And there was just shock all around. Not, I, I, whether or not it's a good marriage or not, it was just shocking. So there are certain things that give certain reads in our culture. I would argue that this kind of hand-holding is a pretty intimate hand-holding. Um, it, it's, it's not just friendship, right? I've got friends, like, we grew up here pretty friendly. There was no internet, there was no movies, there was no radio, there was no television. Okay, once in a while television, depending on where you live. But hugs were common, 
uh, even hand-holding between guys and girls for a little space. Hey, come on, let's go. Um, taking a girl's arm, that was all pretty normal for friendship. But if you were like locked hand-to-hand, -hand, no, that indicated something else. Um, so, please keep in mind that hand-holding means something in this culture. And it's definitely, guys, going to mean something to the girl. So, if you are somewhat casually getting to know someone, then probably hand-holding is inappropriate. Because it seems to indicate something more. But if you're in a serious courtship relationship, it would seem like hand-holding might be appropriate. Um, to kiss or not to kiss? That is the question. Um, I am very old-fashioned about this. Most people disagree with me in um, some sort of way, but they can't. No one's been able to argue me out of the position. So um, here's the deal: kissing implies a very close relationship. And it implies a close relationship um, in a family, right? Families often kiss. Like, my daughters give me kisses all the time. So that implies the relationship that we have. Uh, giving a woman that is not your wife a kiss, giving um, a guy that's not your husband a kiss, implies a lot. What does it imply? It implies some sort of serious relationship. It implies um, a closeness and an, and an intimacy. Um, by the way, there's kind of a rule that whatever, um, whatever you're willing to do in public, you're probably going to do more in private. And reputation, keep that in mind. Um, so, I would argue that a kiss is reserved for marriage. I mean, serious kiss, a, a peck on the cheek is something else. Maybe even a peck on the lips might be something else. But serious kissing, um, I have yet to find the man that tells me that serious kissing with a beautiful young lady that is not his wife um, does not um, ready him for sexual intercourse. It's foreplay. And it's meant for that. And that means it's meant for the wedding bed, the marriage bed. Um, now, not many have taken me up on it, but my challenge is, why don't you reserve the kiss for when, you know, you, that old-fashioned idea of you may now, what? Kiss the bride, as in before you weren't supposed to. It's just this quaint idea that we have. Um, so I encourage, uh, you know, kissing on the cheek, that's fine. That could imply a very close, I mean, I even have friends that I kiss on the cheek, right? So that implies very close, really. if you go to Europe, your cheeks are going to be kissed off. I mean, that's all they do over there. It's just on both sides. Boom, boom. Um, but the kind of passionate kiss that we're so used to in the movies, that really probably should be reserved for the wedding night. Um, so food for thought. I mean, like I said, most people don't like this part of the lecture. I've never had some guy tell me, oh, yeah, I can do that, and I'll be not at all interested in sex. Um, See the person being courted in the context of family, friends, church, etc. See them working, playing, worshiping, learning. Uh, again, how does the young man treat his mother and siblings? You know, uh, what is the relationship of the young lady to her father? Um, so college students, as you go off to college and you perhaps meet your bride or your groom-to-be, you have to find ways to make this happen because no one's going to do it for you in this culture. I mean, maybe you get a group of friends that are willing to commit to that. That would be great. Commit to helping. And a group of older adult friends that would commit to helping. And that's, the whole idea of the college group, in my mind, is just that. Create a context for these kids to know each other, for these young adults to know each other. Um, attraction. Is, is it wrong to find um, a woman very attractive? Is it uh, wrong uh, to find a man so incredibly beautiful. We have arguments in my literature classes whether a man can be beautiful or not. But the answer is always Achilles. He was just beautiful. He was a god. Um, 
It's not wrong to find someone attractive. It's not, I mean, attractive people are always attractive. Is it wrong to go down the route of lust? Of course. But just like, hey, attractive person, great. <laughs> do, we, do we wait until we hit it off with someone? Ooh, we need chemistry. We're on the, the wild search for chemistry, and I can't get married until I'm chemically balanced. Chemistry. Until I find chemistry with someone. I'm not a big chemistry person. <laughs> I just don't think that that's how we find mates. What we normally find there is uh, sin. Now, can it be that, I mean, I, let's put it this way. Some people fall madly in love at first sight, and they just know it, and they get married, and they live happily ever after. Fantastic. Some people fall madly in love. A lot of people fall madly in love. Oh my gosh, the chemistry is perfect. We get married, and five years later, they're divorced. Happens all the time. Some people find each other, and there's not a lot of sparks, but wow, a deep friendship grows. And pretty soon they realize, hey, I can imagine growing old with this person. This would be great. And there's just so many avenues of this type of attraction between men and women that ends up in marriage. And they're all good. They all present their own potential problems. And I know that people are scared to death that, oh my gosh, what if I married the wrong man or the wrong woman? Well, if you've done your homework and you've done some of these principles, you shouldn't end up there. What happens, well, my gosh, he never picks up his clothes and puts them in the dirty clothes. I'm sorry, women, that's ubiquitous. That's just what being married means. Um, what? I mean nothing. <laughs> so what is the, what's the masculine response to these ideas in our culture? What would most men in our culture say to everything I've just presented? Such a killjoy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Would they like the responsibility that I'm asking of them by this? Oh no, they'd love it. What? <laughs> That's big sarcastic. No, <laughs> it ruins the whole world of men that we've created today, where we've got. Uh, 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 we have apps on phones. They can they swipe them. right, swipe left, and you've got your hookup for the night. And guys like this. Responsibility-free sex is like the guy's dream. What's the feminine response to these ideas in our culture? Probably a little more positive. Generally a little more positive. Now, they might still think I'm a freak and, you know, I'm wearing a dress, so. <laughs> they may be a little more cynical, like, yeah, right, father. They're definitely like cynical. That. But I've sat with... give you a couple situations. I've sat with couples uh, talking about marriage and with one I said um, all right so you're living together um, so I need um, you to commit to not sleeping with each other until the wedding night. It's only three months away. It's possible. Really it's possible. And the guy goes ah, that's funny it's funny. And she goes okay. <laughs> Completely different response, right out of bat, because she wants the things that we've been talking about because it protects her, you know, it gives her value, and he, in general, he, the big he, just wants what the world has given him in our sexualized and oversexed culture. Um, so it was hilarious. She's like, okay, and he goes, uh, what? Are you serious? What? And then after the wedding. Uh, Christian man came up to me and said, Father, thank you, that was beautiful, really enjoyed it. I'm so glad you asked them to stop sleeping together before the wedding. I said, Wow, we told you that. He <laughs> said, Yeah, he's pretty he's pretty open. He didn't like it, but you know. Um, and then uh, another one, a uh, couple that had been living together forever, had children, and I said, Well, here's you know, here's what marriage is. Um, yeah, and finally we're just going through some information and and he says, Well, that's pretty much what we have anyways. I'm not committed to her. She knows that. And I looked at her and I said, is this what you have anyways? Is this commitment there? She says, not at all. It's completely different. 
So you'd like him to actually take vows in a public ceremony? She says, yes, absolutely. So just remember that females and males view all this stuff very, very differently, and particularly within the context of her culture, which is, you know, a mess. Um, okay, there's a number of what ifs. What if there's no father? What if there's no Christian family? What if there's no family at all? Um, there's, and you could come up with a hundred questions. Again, I'm not giving you some lockstep courtship that you have to do it this way. I'm saying all these biblical principles will lead to an approach to courtship or to dating for marriage or to marriage, whatever you want to call it. I'm not even trying to give it a name. Excuse me. These biblical principles will give you the answers. So if there's no family at all, well, this is a completely different thing. We don't have a family to get to know. Well, who's her friend group? Who, who raised her? What, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. That's where all of us need pastoral care. We need people to help us to uh, take these biblical principles and apply them in such a situation. We have to change, we have to adapt, we have to be flexible, but the biblical principles are the guide. Courtship that is biblical leads to a biblical marriage. C.S. Lewis again. People get from books the idea that if you have married the right person, you ex may expect to go on being in love forever. As a result, when they find they are not, they think this proves that they have made a mistake and are entitled to a change, not realizing that when they have changed, the glamour will presently go out of the new love just as it went out of the old one. Let the thrill go, let it die away, go on through that period of death into the quieter interest and happiness that follow you, that follow, and you will find that you are living in a world of new thrills all the time. But if you decide to make thrills your regular diet and try to prolong them artificially, they will get weaker and weaker and fewer and fewer, and you will be a bored, disillusioned old man for the rest of your life. It is much better fun to learn to swim than to go on endlessly and hopelessly trying to get back the feeling you had when you first went paddling as a small boy. The life of Christian marriage is an exciting life. My wife is constantly finding out that I am new and different. There's all sorts of things, unexpected things, that are bad about me that she didn't know. Um, and we've, you know, but seriously, those of you that have been married a long time, You've got, you've got just something to stand on to experience new things. Now, you, you probably know the response of your spouse and what that's going to look like. But that doesn't make it any less thrilling. It does make it fun when the response is a little different. Oh, well, where'd that come from? And you learn something new. Um, so, if you're a young lady in this culture, everyone expects you not to be a mom and a and a, a wife. That, that, that's never the first thing on anyone's lips. What are you going to do? What's your vocational call? So some of you may, well, most of you actually do have from God a vocational calling to motherhood and to wifelyhood. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Many of you, well, all of you, will also have other callings. Some of them will earn money, some won't. My wife should have been earning money for 22 years, but I just never paid her anything because she's just such a great lady. Um, actually, to be honest, why that happens, it just it makes more sense taxation-wise for the paycheck to go to me. Honestly, that's the only reason. Um, and that way I get to hide away part of it by cigars and beer. <laughs> um, but young ladies, God, God's going to call you to marriage and motherhood. Most of you. God may call some of you to a convent. He may call you to living a single life for his glory. St. Paul says it. It's not, you know, it's not somewhere out in left field. This is straight biblical stuff. But historically, culturally, the great majority of you young ladies will become wives and mothers. The great majority of you young men, hopefully you'll grow up into real men, no offense, and <laughs> become husbands and fathers. If a woman is off on a career. So Emma graduates college and there's no real men there, it's just a bunch of boys. And so she's like, well, I'm not dealing with these guys. 
As she goes up, she becomes a dressmaker. What do you call it? The, the seamstress. And she's making costumes for movies, right? Dream job. She's making costumes for movies. And, and then a guy comes into her life. And it's the choice becomes, at some point, do I continue to do this or do I get married? My point is that make your plans, follow through with the plans, and when the guy comes, don't be afraid to give up your plans. I know a young lady, maybe not so young, who has lived multiple vocational, um, well, one, maybe two basic vocational lives, single, and um, a, a gentleman wants to uh, marry her, but he was concerned that, well, I don't want to derail her from where she's going. She's got a career path and things are going. I said, oh, I think you should derail her. And I talked with the lady and I said, well, there's a concern that, that you are on a path and you've got goals and to derail would be rude and inconsiderate. And she said, please, derail immediately. Do not waste any time. Um, so being a man and messing up a woman's plans, I would say, don't be afraid of doing that. And if she says no, then you know she's not for you. Right? Now, does that mean that you can't have careers that match? No, not at all. My wife and I have been teaching together for a long time. And um, when she had lots of little children at home, she wasn't in school every day all day. She was there every day in the morning, and she would actually teach, I think, a kindergarten math class. And then twice a week, we'd have a babysitter, and she'd come and teach logic. Um, so that, that was a career path for Mrs. Foose that was very doable as a mom, as a wife, and um, being involved in the school. And at the time, with all the three little munchkins running around, she wasn't in the school very often. But it doesn't mean she disappeared altogether. So it's just kind of... It's, the, 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 it's whatever God has given us all to work with. And sometimes, sometimes women have to give up what they're doing if they want to get married. But the choice is theirs, right? I mean, so I wouldn't be afraid of that. Questions? No questions. Nothing. You've got it down. Did I miss anything that we should have addressed? I know I have because things popped into my head and then fell off the other side. Um, so let's pray. The Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty God, we pray your blessing upon our church in America that you would uh, bring young people to you first and then to each other in a God glorifying and winsome and appropriate way to find spouses, to get married, to build families, to raise up the next generation to glorify you. And we ask your blessing upon each of these young people here, that they would be blessed in their search for a mate, and that you would um, not let cynicism overwhelm our culture, at least not overwhelm the church. We ask these things in our sons. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Questions? If you have questions, let me know. Thank you.